Right, for that, for that photo. James, can we hear? Can you hear me all right? Am I? So we can hear you. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, right. Uh, yes. It's sort of um, talk about some of the software tools. And let's say some of the information sources that James has been talking about, you know, vary in scale and size quite considerably. But I've just got a sort of little collage here of the various information sources. Uh, top uh, left up there, we have some, some bottom photographs. We have some uh, big scale um, bathymetry, possibly from the very deep ocean. Some of, the, some of these areas, some of these areas here are seven thousand meters deep. Um, we've got some very shallow water from aerial um, satellite imagery, side scan sonar. We've got other sources as well. We've got um, multi beam. We've got some interpretive multi beam. We have uh, various admiralty charts, and geology maps, and all kinds of things. We've got all kinds of sources of information. And effectively, what are we going to do with that? We're going to have to an, an analyze this in a spatial way. And why are we doing this? Because we want to look at the various pressures and the requirements and the environment. And you know, it's sort of just looking at the economic pressures that are required on our marine data and, and, and what we're going to be using it for. Um, this beach here looks incredibly busy in terms of, and is there a, a certain sort of a competition between those on boats and those on the beach, it's sort of, uh, it looks like a good fun, you know, sort of uh, things like that. Um, you know, sort of economic pressures, you know, how do we use the water? There's some dredging going on here, but they are causing an ecological difference, uh, sort of, uh, to see what's going on. And, you know, we can look at various corals before and after, you know, sort of, to, to, to actually see sort of uh, the difference uh, that things are happening to, to our things. So sort of going back to some marine data, as, as James has been talking about, one of the main ones that we quite often use is bathymetry, depth of the ocean, depth of the sea. And sort of um, together with that, some of the, the main ones that we tend to play with are the, what we call backscatter, which is effectively the strength of the sonar information coming back from a multi-beam system or using side scan sonar. We've got some examples of side scan sonar um, here, sort of uh, looking at the seabed, and you can see little, little dots here, and these are little sort of um, pockmarks, little, little holes in the ocean where there is a certain amount of degassing of, of the sediments and stuff like that. And then sort of we then start looking at photographic imagery of the seafloor, and here we can see this little, little, this little thing here is a micro ROV, which is diving down to the seabed. Uh, fortunately, I've got a diver, you know, sort of uh, actually following it with a snorkel and goes down and has a quick look of, at, at the uh, things. It's shallow enough at, the, at this point, but there's a camera within this and it can take photographs of the seafloor and effectively give you um, some kind of idea of what the seafloor actually looks like. And you can then start doing your ground truth thing as James was, uh, was talking about. So we can get either photographic imagery of the seafloor or we can actually get physical samples using maybe using a grab. And then sort of also we can start looking at satellite imagery. I'm going, to, I'm going to leave satellite imagery at the moment because the next session on Monday, um, we're going to be talking a lot about satellite imagery and how we can actually get some bathymetry from it. Um, there are all kinds of other there's a marine survey data. I've put them in slightly lighter blue, uh, sort of which have been talked about in the previous sessions uh, on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday previously. But the, the, this, this is all, all, all come up quite you know, sort of. Uh, Things like this. So, sort of, yeah, these are these are other things. Bathymetric lidar. Again, James was talking about a little bit about that as well. So, what are we going to do with this? Well, obviously, what we do is we put these into some kind of geographic information systems, and sort of, uh, and we, you know, sort of, that data normally comes in with some kind of latitude and longitude, and sort of, and we can then put that in. And effectively, there's two major ways of putting that in. It's either imagery, which actually has coverage, it is covering the whole area. And that can either be as a, as a, as a nice TIFF image or a geo TIFF image, geo just meaning it has latitude and longitude. An ordinary TIFF image may not have latitude and longitude attached to it. And so therefore you've got to actually then geo reference it. You've got to then try and put it on the map there. But hopefully some of, a lot of the data that you'll, you'll be getting will actually be either as a geo TIFF image or actually may come in various proprietary formats 
an imagined imagery format that is a very common one um, in GIS systems. Uh, JPEGs quite often are not geographically registered unless they have this EXIF data attached to them. And quite often that EXIF data is there. It's very hidden and sometimes very difficult to actually extract. But quite often uh, it, will, it will actually have that data there. And of course, it is exceedingly useful because it will have latitude and longitude of possibly the point that the photograph was taken. If it's a JPEG, say, for instance, and it may have its orientation as well. And if you know its orientation of where it was taken and maybe how high it is above the surface. If it's a, a sort of a, a, a photograph taken on the sea floor, maybe you have how high it is above, above the sea floor and also in which direction it was looking at. And hopefully it was looking straight down, maybe it had a slight tilt to it and sort of a, but if we have that information in the EXIF, EXIF data, we can actually then put that on, onto a map and bingo, you've then actually georeferenced your photograph on the seabed. And so that's imagery formats. Vector formats are anything that is either going to be a point um, or a line or what we call a polygon, i.e. an area, but it's just a, a fixed um, shape on, on, on your map of, of uh, sort of something on, on that. And you can either have those as shape files, sort of a, which is quite common, or they can actually just be ordinary text files or um, databases coming out of Excel or anything like that, or just comma separate comma separated um, variables, which is you know sort of a, a table um, of, of data, hopefully having a, a latitude and a longitude or a X and Y position. Um, and things like that. I'm just give an example here to, to the side here of a, um, a, a GIS um, snapshot that I've just taken, um, just, just to show you, here, here is a map that I've created that has got bathymetry at the background. You can probably see there's greens and blues. Uh, there, there are some, some hills and uh, various bits and pieces. And then we have got some side scan sonar. This is the sort of the yellowy, uh, black and white, not yellowy, bluey, uh, black and white, uh, grayscale image. And we've got some polygons, sort of colored polygons here. We've got lines and we have points. So there's all kinds of things going on, on there. Now, this is an example of the GIS software uh, coming from Esri, the, the company called Esri, which is ArcMap. Uh, but there are other um, GIS software systems and sort of, uh, and again, sort of uh, the QGIS one is probably one that you may have all come across because it is free. It is a fr freeware. The Esri ArcMap system, I'm afraid, is not free. It, is, it, it has to be paid for. It is licensed and um, does, you know, sort of uh, this, but it is the market leader. It is the best that is out there. And I would say it's actually better than the QGIS as well, but I'm, I am biased because I use Esri and you'll see later that I use our Esri a lot. Okay, let's give an exa another example of QGIS, no, sorry, not QGIS, of Esri of ArcMap. Um, it's sort of, here's a, 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 an island, this is archipelago, this is the British Virgin Islands. Um, and you can see I've got some bathymetry data. I have got some side scan data. I've got some underlying uh, satellite imagery, um, which is showing all kinds of patterns on it and, and stuff like this. And effectively, down here on the left hand side, you can see that I have got quite a lot of data files. Not all of them are ticked. If they're ticked, that means that they'll be shown on the map. If they're unticked, they will not show. But I've got lots and lots of data files. And quite often, you, know, you will have quite a lot of data files um, for an area. And you're going, great, this is really nice. I like, like that. But quite often it's a case of exactly what data have I got and have I got control of my data? Do I know everything about it? Um, so I'll be showing you a little bit about this marine tools toolbar in a second. And if I was to press this little button here, uh, it's sort of a, what it'll do, it actually gets you to, to tell you what my table of contents list is. So it lists all, all the files, all the data, data sets I've got and effectively what are the, all the information about those data sets? And effectively, whether it's a polygon or a polyline, he's got a, it's line data, and there are 466 lines in this data of contours, right, okay. Um, the polygons, there are a large number of polygons here. And then sort of there are some imagery. Is it eight bit image? Is it I, a grayscale of 0 to 255? Is it the symmetry? Is each pixel value a real value? Floating point means it's a real value. 
So these are you know, all kinds of different data sets. And sometimes it's important to know um, what the difference is and what you've got and how many bands we've got. We've got some satellite imagery here. I've got seven bands of satellite imagery. And here's the, the number of rows and columns, i.e. the number of pixels that we've got. And it's resolution 30 meters. Now, what I also find is incredibly useful and it's actually quite important is the fact which projection it has, it has used. Now you'll see that most of these have been using UTM zone 20. Now, it's a way of describing the, uh, the Earth's surface um, on a certain projection and sort of, uh, and this one's quite good for doing relatively small areas. I would suggest it's actually quite good for doing um, areas of the, of the Caribbean. Um, maybe zone 20, maybe zone 19 or 18, depending on exactly where you know, sort of um, you are looking. But you've also noticed I've got other projection systems. Uh, this is a geographic coordinate system, um, which means it's just in latitude and longitude. And you're sort of, um, and you're going, okay, uh, but it's using the WGAC4 um, data. I do notice I've got this one, which is GCS North American 1983. So I'm going, hang on a second, what does this actually mean? So sort of uh, projection information is incredibly important, but do we actually understand what it might be telling us? So one of the things that we, it might be telling us is in fact, how we are describing the Earth's surface. Sort of the Earth is effectively a squashed egg, as, 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 as you can see here. It has a semi-major and semi-minor uh, axes, A and B. And effectively, we can get a sort of shape of the Earth. But effectively, the values for A and B depends on who's been using it. And effectively, sort of um, a common one that I think is used quite a lot is the WGS84 um, values of A and RF, the reciprocal flattening. But as you can see, some of these, these values change, which of course will change the shape of the Earth. Now you're going, well, does this actually matter? And I'm going, yes, it does, I'm afraid. It's sort of, we know the projections of the Earth. You, we can either have them as uh, conic, i.e. we put a cone over the Earth and it touches maybe at a certain place, maybe it touches at two different places. And we then try and match the earth to a piece of paper. So we have a flat piece of paper that represents our map area. Um, we can have cylindrical ones and we're sort of um, cylindrical either on the equator. We can have it a cylindrical on, the, uh, on a, at a line of longitude, get it right, yeah, longitude. Or we can have it some, some oblique line uh, sort of uh, going across there. Now, the advantage of, say, the cylindrical one here um, is the fact that when you are looking at around at near that longitude, the amount of distortion, because the Earth is not absolutely flat, the amount of distortion is very little. And you're going, OK, sort of uh, maybe that's, that's probably the one to use. Uh, this, uh, sort of this, the one going around the equator means that the, around the equator, um, the mass distortion is very little. This is around a single line of longitude. And effectively, the universal transverse Mercator um, projection takes a, um, a single line of longitude, and you can choose um, various options of long, uh, universe transverse Mercator. It has 60 zones going all around the Earth, and effectively, every six degrees of longitude, it will choose a new zone and effectively I would suggest that you start to start using using this and sort of a, whereas you know the, uh, if you would use conic the amount of distortion on that line and that on the two lines where it crosses is very little but it gets quite bad in between those two and effectively you know, sort of on this conic it gets quite bad getting away from whatever standard parallel latitude has been used this one gets pretty is pretty good unless you go you know a long way away from that central longitude of that. And I will say that I have fallen foul of it myself because I, I'll give you a little little example. Uh, sort of, I was doing a survey um, a few years ago now, fortunately. Um, and 
I was acquiring multi-beam bathymetry. I was going up and down um, on this date, on this area, thinking, ah, this is really good. And I, got, I got, got this data and I said, right, okay, well, I'm gonna go up towards what's called Gernard Ledge and sort of, and, and start doing things here. I was acquiring data in WGS84 and I thought, oh, that's all right. And as my background, I had the admiralty chart behind. Unfortunately, the admiralty chart was a slightly old one. It was a 1999 uh, admiralty chart, and it was in a different uh, spheroid and a datum. They were both projected on a map together, but they were using a different datum. And effectively, I was going up here, and I said to the captain, right, OK, well, you know, we've gone up, up this line here. Right, we can do the next line up here, because I hadn't actually been watching the data very carefully. I've just been sort of going, yeah, everything's fine. We're collecting good data and we're still safe because it's nice and deep. It's deeper than this 0.4 meters here. What I had not to do, the captain said, no, no, I'm not going down any further. I was going, why not? And, and he sort of said, I don't want to go aground. And I'm going, no, no, you're miles away. And so, at which point I realized I had made a mistake. And effectively, because I was using a different spheroid that, uh, from, uh, and on the map, I was actually 150 meters um, putting my map in the wrong place. And effectively, you can see sort of that point there should have been here. And so therefore, therefore, I was actually asking the boat to go over here, which is probably not a good idea. And we would have gone aground and sort of uh, people wouldn't be very happy. So yes, yeah, so we go up and down collecting data. So that's quite often what we do with bathymetry. We use a multi-beam bathymetry echo sounder quite regularly. And um, a word of the month, word of the month is boostrophodonic, which means effectively doing that lawnmower pattern going up and down, left to right, and then right to left, and then left to right, and like that. You get a nice uh, sort of a zigzag pattern like, like you can see here. And one of the things that we can do with the software I'm about to show you is you actually supply the area that you want to survey. Might be, might be square, may not be, and sort of a, and there's a program in there, you just tell it what direction you want your lines to go in and how far you want them to be spaced. And bingo, it comes out with a nice set of lines. You give these set of lines to the skipper of the boat and he says, yes, fine, okay, I will, I will follow that and, and do, do that and produce effectively a nice lawn, uh, mode lawn sort of of the seabed. And, we, and that happens with echo sounders. Um, it also happens with LIDAR. Because again, their width of uh, survey is actually relatively um, sort of re relatively narrow, shall we say? And, sort of, uh, and you just go up and you you just keep mowing mowing the grass, uh, sort of uh, as we often call it. Uh, there is one thing that sort of um, James alluded to just slightly, and he was talking about satellite altimetry. And satellite altimetry is effectively why we've got maps of the ocean that cover the whole ocean. We go, hey, great, we've got all, all the bathymetry, no problem at all. But effectively, what our satellite altimetry is doing is taking from satellite, and it's got a radar, and it will measure the height of the sea surface at any point. And we know that the sea surface should be approximately sort of on that spheroid um, of the, uh, what's actually called the geoid. But effectively, what happens on the seafloor, there are lumps and bumps. And those lumps and bumps are made of rock, generally, or something hard. And of course, large lumps of rock have a gravitational attraction to them. So effectively, the sea surface over, say, a small seamount will actually go up. Sea surface is not flat. It's sort of, uh, sort of, including the waves. And sort of, uh, and it, you know, what we can measure is how high the sea surface is above there. And effectively, that distance, we can say, oh, the sea surface is high. Therefore, we know that there's some kind of gravitational attraction out here. Problem is, it's actually relatively low, low resolution. And sort of, uh, and it will give. It's great for doing glo global maps. You, you see it on on the screen. You go great. But if you just zoom into it, you'll actually see the pixels are huge, and sort of the areas that it is choosing is. Uh, it does, it measures this many, many, many times and takes the average to remove any top amounts of uh, waves and anything like that. So it's sort of uh, do it, doing that. But it's actually why we get full, full bathymetry for the whole, whole planet. Um, but actually, 
it's actually very low resolution. Anyway, right. So yeah, we have got our bathymetry. We've got some, some nice bathymetry, and as uh, James has explained, the slope is really good for habitat mapping. The sort of um, the, uh, the various habitats that require a steep slope, or maybe require a certain amount of roughness. Aspect, depending on which way it is, it is looking at, and uh, and, and and you know, sort of uh, whether it's facing into a current, or whether the current's going past it quite nicely. And curvature is it. These are all derivatives which are quite standard and sort of uh, something we can calculate quite easily and I'm going to show you that in a moment. There's also something called a uh, the benthic terrain modeler. Um, again this is this is a technique that's been around for a few years and effectively what it does is it takes a bathymetry map and divide and effectively finds certain areas and these are the certain areas that it, it sort of finds or this, these are the fault areas that it can find. And I think this, this normally becomes quite useful for people. So it'll actually work out on the orbithymetry whether you've got small peaks on a rise or a ridge, um, or just, just a ridge itself, if it's actually smooth, or you have a bit of a trough on your ridge. Do you have um, something which has a little ridge, but it's a relatively flat area, uh, sort of, uh, or you know, is it flat with a bit of a trough? We have deep areas, flat, flat areas which are deep, we have flat areas which are shallower. We can have steep slopes, or maybe we have steep slopes but in a shallower area. And then sort of we have depressions with a little ridge in, depressions ordinary of depression with a little trough in. Sort of so you know, sort of what you can do is you can actually classify the whole of this doing doing that, and you'll get some kind of map like this. And this is this is a technique that is quite you quite used uh, quite regularly um, for, for looking at things, and you're going, great, you know, sort of uh, the peaks on here possibly are going to be little coral coral heads and possibly sort of um, and you can see sort of well various various things we've got good deep area here both sides of this little ridge here so we sort of um, and it, it, it does a certain certain amount certain amount of classification I'm only going to say certain amount I'm going to say I don't know what classification is this is when you need the ground truth that, that James talked about and sort of and take, taking that further so the question is how are we going to do this you know, sort of, um, so what I'm actually going to offer you is a piece of software. It's available online. Um, it is available now um, under this uh, web, web address. It's sort of, uh, it is on the, the workshops uh, page that you would have gone, gone through to register. Uh, it is available now. Uh, sort of, I will repeat this 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 uh, quite regularly. So I'll give you time to either write it down or I'll I'll put it in the chat as well at the, in, at the end. And this is a toolbar, which allows you to do some of the techniques that I have shown, and I'll show a few show a few a bit more, and maybe even get a demo of it as well. That you can run within ArcMap. So it is using the ArcMap, the Esri ArcMap uh, software. Uh, it does require ArcMap and it requires a spatial analyst, both of which, uh, well, they come together and they are licensed software, I'm afraid. It is sort of, uh, um, but a lot of your institutions may have it. There is some functionality in, in QGIS as well, which is, is, is the free version, but this toolbar will not work on that yet. I will say yet, I'm hoping to do it on there, but I don't know sort of, uh, sort of how far I can get with that at the moment. And the advantage of this toolbar really is to provide people with, oops, uh, uh, with techniques, the standard techniques that people use, either as a toolbar or as a toolbox, for those who have you know, used the toolbox and tools, um, or they, they're available in two different ways. And it will give them a result. Quite often I have used some of these methods uh, methods and techniques and found I got ooh, nothing at the end. It just didn't look like anything at all. And I'd obviously made a mistake. So I tried again and no, it didn't really work. And I was going, oh, gee whiz, you know, sort of, uh, I then learned more, more about it. And I was going, well, if I'm having problems and I'm meant to be somebody who is in the know, how is a lot of, you know, sort of a lot of other users going to have, have you know, sort of with, with some of these. And the more I got into it, the more I went realized it wouldn't it be useful to have everything, um, all the standard processing techniques together uh, for marine habitat mapping or marine uh, mapping. And sort of, uh, 
So the advantage is, you know, sort of the techniques are all there, or quite a lot of techniques are there. And I'm adding more and more as time goes on. You don't, you know, the user does not need to know programming. And sort of, they're all written in Python. If you want to look at the program, you can look at the program. That's fine by me. If you want to edit it, that's fine, but you don't need to. Um, or you want it to do something else. You know, sort of, you don't do that, that, that extra bit. Hey, uh, that, 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 that's fine by me too. Just let me know because I'd be interested too. Um, then sort of, um, and it's, yeah, it's getting them all in one location. And so you don't need to search for them. Yeah, so that's the other thing is um, the art map produces lots of tools for you to use, but you've got to search for them. And also, you know, sort of quite often you have to string a few together. Um, sort of, um, and that's, you know, the things, it's quite of those met the methods use the standard tools, but, you know, sort of, and you have to use one after the other, after the other, after the other, other until you get a result. And possibly if you don't do one of the steps correctly, you're going to go, oops, you know, it's like this. Um, it's sort of, uh, and then you have to start again. And sort of, uh, here I've, I've strung them all together already. For instance, the Brentwick Terrain Modeler Wizard you know, that does the previous steps that I was showing has 26 steps at least to produce a result. If you made a mistake in one of those steps, you'd have to start again. You might get slightly disheartened. So this is to save time and your effort and produce a result you can look at and go, hey, if I change that parameter, how does it look like that? So you just change that parameter at the beginning, it goes through, changes it, and gives you another, it gives you another result. Um, okay, it might take a minute to, to process. Um, and you go, okay, well, if it takes a minute, I'll go and have a cup, quick cup, cup of tea. I'll go and quick, quickly talk to my colleague or something like that. So yes, it's sort of, um, it is you know, something that is available there. And sort of, as I say, it comes in either as a toolbar or as a set of tools. And the, the various categories are uh, for bathymetry itself. There's sort of, um, there's all kinds of um, things for bathymetry. There's imagery, which is the side scan sonar and the bottom photographs, say, for instance. There's a satellite one, which I'll talk more about on Monday. And then there's all kinds of interpretation techniques, including Bentley Terrain Modeler. So things like object-based image analysis, things like maximum likelihood classifier. These are all wonderful names and sort of, uh, hopefully you can get at something out of them quite quickly and you can get, get, get a result and then go, well, do I like it? As, as James says, getting a result is all very well, but then you've got to go back and then check to see what, whether it actually means something. And then various utilities. Uh, one is for changing things so that they're all on the same projection. Um, for instance, you know, sort of that's very useful. Because if, if, you, if they're all in the same projection and, and using the same datum and things, when you're looking at them, you can actually sort of um, make sure that everything is, is working. So to give an example, here we have one of um, some slope. So it's very straightforward. Um, and then sort of you take bathymetry and it will produce some kind of slope map. But what it actually does is not only do a slope map, but you can do a certain amount of smoothing. If your bathymetry is very noisy, i.e. it's got a lot of error in it and sort of jitter, as I sometimes call it, on the, on the data, you can just smooth that over to, to get some nice slope values. And so we've got some nice slope values. And a little trick for those who have done a little bit of this before, but one I would suggest to people, is that you create your slope map. You put your slope map underneath the colors of the bathymetry, but then allow the colors of the bathymetry to have a certain amount of transparency, which therefore allows you to tell that say this area here is a shallow area and this, and this area is a deep area. So you can start to see where, you know, sort of where the uh, things like that. And it makes a much better um, bathymetric, a, a more 3D-ish um, map. It is a map still, it is, in, it, is, it is in 2D, but it has a certain amount of, your, your eyes will actually see it slightly more in, in, in 3D. And it is much better than doing a shaded relief. It used to be that we always did shaded relief um, maps rather than slope maps. But if you put a slope map underneath, then the uh, the imagery will look a, a lot better. You know, sort of, uh, is it because sometimes three D maps, uh, sort of shaded relief maps, you look at them in certain certain ways, will look like the deeps are high and the highs are deep. Um, sort of, uh, or you know, and, and suddenly flip from one 
one way or the other can produce optical illusions there. So be careful with sh shade relief. And that's why I think slope maps are so much, so much better. The other thing is, of course, slope is important for habitat. And then also for looking at um, for ruggedness, sort of, um, again, I'd say a slightly different one. We've got our bathymetry, and then we can see how rough, rough ruggedness and roughness are approximately the same thing. And we, but we can change our neighborhood size. Here I've used a value of three instead of, uh, in, here's the little tool that you would do. You put in your, last, uh, your input bathymetry and it would automatically give you a default output name, which is always useful. Um, and uh, sort of a, but then I changed it from three to 15 and you can start to see, okay, yes, it, it's slightly smoothed it. But one of the advantages is that if you can see that there are little squares here and these squares are saying that's very rough and I'm going, no, it shouldn't be. So therefore, I would assume that there are little pixels here, or certain pixels, that are very, very, well, probably incorrect. There's a sort of, a, or either there's, there's, there's either something sticking out of the seafloor, or there's a hole in the seafloor in, in, this, in this position. And there's a, few, there's a few of them around. And sort of, some of them are quite big, as you can see here. And these here, I can't see at all, and I can't see at all in here. So it, sort of, uh, it does sometimes pick out what's you know, going on in your, in, in your map. I mentioned benthic terrain modeler before. It's sort of, um, again, I'll just use it on this data set. And again, all you have to do is input your, your bathymetry data, data set. And it, then it comes up with all the following. As soon as you put that in, everything else will fill. Now, you don't have to use these values. You know, they're any suggested values, but what it will do is it'll, it, it'll do all the things that Benthic Terrain Modeler, and it's, it's a published, published technique. And if you go to show help, it will, it'll tell you all about it. So the help is there to explain what, what's going on. Um, but you know, sort of, uh, we've got some values here. You know, sort of, uh, the actual technique itself, when you actually run it without my, my toolbox, gives you no, no numbers at all. It just says, get on with it. I'm going, no, I want to know some numbers so I can try it. And then when I get a result, I um, may have a go at changing those numbers instead of five and 50 for this broad scale uh, BPI, um, then maybe I'll change it to three and 25. I don't know, sort of a, um, a bit. The other thing is um, sort of, a, I've given it a, what's called a classification. I can produce my own classification dictionary or I can use a default one. And I find using a default one to start with, it'll actually create it for you. You can then go and look at it and then you can work out whether you want to change it. Do I want to change where deeper and shallow are for the flat areas? It'll give um, your output file. It'll be out as a raster and as a polygon. So on here, you can't actually tell whether it's a raster or a polygon. I can't remember actually which, which one's there, but it's generally the polygons that you, you probably want to look at. So you've got an area here, which is this color, which is the flat and deeper, is that right? I'm not quite sure of my colors here. Um, and sort of, um, sort of, and then the other flat and shallow is, is up here, yes. And sort of, and then you've got some um, steep, steep sides going on here. But it has just classified the terrain, uh, mm. which I think is actually quite, quite useful. Again, because certain areas, shallow and steep, this red area may be indicative of a certain habitat type. And sort of, uh, yeah, sort of the only other thing is a couple of tick box. Do I want to delete in intermediate files? It does produce some, some, some intermediate files because it's doing quite a lot of work. Um, so it, you know, quite often I just delete them and say, yeah, I don't, want to, I don't want to look at those. And the other thing is depths should be positive for this model. So do you want to invert your depths? Are your depths negative or are your depths positive? And sort of, uh, doesn't really matter as long as you tick or untick that box. And it's another uh, technique that we quite often use on, on this is what's called object-based image analysis. Um, and this is a quite difficult technique. Um, it's been around for quite a while, but not in the marine environment at all. Uh, and it's been, it's been the environment of computer scientists, as far as I can tell. And what it is doing, it is taking some data, and it takes a certain amount of data, uh, I mean, this one here takes bathymetry, and backscatter and says, right, okay, if I add those two together, it's sort of, can I classify the area looking at 
certain characteristics of those two data sets and say, well, these have similar characteristics. So we're looking at characteristics and what it's doing is it's saying, I've got all your characteristics in black dots and I want to cluster those and sort of, uh, this is a 2D clustering system. Um, this one, um, we're actually seeing the result of is actually a three, three dimensional clustering system, but it's easier to understand a, a 2D clustering system. And it's just saying, well, I think all those points there belong to this class. These points belong to this cluster of points and we'll call it a class of something probably just class one, two, three, four, and five, um, because we don't know, actually know what those are until we add um, uh, ground, ground truth in. And sort of, um, sort of uh, so therefore we're doing, doing that. So this is another tool within uh, the toolbar. So we've got, and what it does in fact, is it takes the bathymetry, uses the bathymetry to count slope and roughness. It then uses the slope, the roughness, and the backscatter to say, right, those are the three I'm going to use. I'm not going to actually use bathymetry. I could use bathymetry, but I'm sort of going to say, look, let's, let's just use some slope and roughness, because I think slope and roughness are the two things that are biologically more important. And the backscatter will probably tell you more about the substrate. So, hey, you know, sort of, uh, let's, let's have a look at that. And it'll output a file of polygons. And effectively, this purple polygon here and these purple ones here theoretically have the same statistical information of slope, roughness, and backscatter. And what it is, of course, we don't know until we put some kind of ground truth on it. And when you run this, you can supply the number of clusters. So how many different classes? Here on this one, I've got five. This one, I think I went for 10, I can't remember. Um, and again, you can change that to see how it clusters best. Um, one thing is actually, you can actually ask the system to say, well, tell me how many classes you think it is. Put a value of zero in and sort of it goes, oh, right, okay, let's give that a go. And then you also say, well, how regional or how local do I want those polygons to be? Do I want them really small? And then for it to then expand and sort of say, well, I'm gonna do it on a quite small basis, or do I actually want to do it on a more regional basis and sort of um, pick, out, pick out information from that? So that, that, that will be the way that uh, we can do this. This, of course, is unsupervised. It's not using any kind of ground truth information yet. Okay, it's sort of, and you add maybe the, the ground truth information to this. Maybe you use this to actually define where you're gonna take ground truth. I'm gonna take a ground truth point or a few ground truth points in this purple area. I'm gonna take some in this orangey brown area and maybe take some ground truth samples in this green, green area and in the blue area. And maybe the dark blue, you know, depending on the sort of, I want to know what the dark blue really means. You know, is it sand? Is it mud? Is it sandy mud? Or I'm just going to take a, a video down and sort of start looking at the various biota that's down there. So that's one way of doing it. And that's called unsupervised. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And then sort of, we can also look at what's called a, classic, a supervised classification using various methods called either maximum likelihood or the Oh gosh, I always forget this surface vector modeler. Is that right? Oh, I can't remember. SVM, I call it. Um, where actually you define areas and it includes some tools. You define the polygons, you know, so the, the data set that you're going to use. And you can then define the, uh, the, what class that's going to be. And you use this little tool for drawing. You can see it's a little, little pen, nib. And effectively, I've gone click, 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 click around a small area thinking, well, I think this area here is mud. And I think this area is mud. I'll then have changed this where it says mud. I then typed in mixed, say for instance, you can type in anything you like, and then maybe clicked on this area and maybe this area. I'm using these areas as a sort of training area, sort of a training data. And again, sort of, uh, here we go. So if we actually run, run the whole thing, Here's, here's the tool for it. Again, I've told it I want to use the bathymetry. I want to use the backscatter. That's all I'm using. And then sort of, um, it'll just output the files under the, the input file of the picked classes, polygon areas, as I defined here, and sort of, and then output, bingo. Hit, okay, off it goes. Nice and, nice and straightforward. And you can actually start doing this. And then you say, well, maybe I won't use that area of mud. Maybe I don't like that. I'll take that one away. I'll erase it from the file, at which point, oh, pardon me, um, 
you know, sort of uh, how will it change the classification? Um, because effectively I haven't told it that this is mud. Maybe it'll, it'll still find mud here. Let's, let's, let's see, let's see what's going on. You know, sort of, uh, so yes, sort of, uh, so sort of um, getting towards the end, sort of how do I get this toolbox? And effectively, as I say, it's available on this, um, this website. And you'll see this box here, sort of uh, called Workshop Executables, and you, you'll download effectively a 75 megabyte executable. You then need to run it, and effectively it'll come up with this. Uh, you will need administrative privilege to do this on your computer. It's sort of, uh, so you may need to get people to do that for you, uh, sort of, uh, and whether you have privilege for that or not. But it can be used under standard user IDs as well. Uh, sort of down there. So sort of, um, it says welcome. There is a license agreement, and it's a standard end user license agreement. Um, it doesn't say very much at all. It just says, if you use it, you use it at your own risk type of thing. Um, not, nothing much more than that. At which point they then says, well, where do you want to install it? Now you can install it anywhere you like. Uh, the default is actually on the, on the main C disk under Marine Tools. So you can change that as much as you want. So you know, sort of um, no problem about that. It requires about 250 megabytes of space, it suggests. Um, I was fortunate I have plenty of space there. And then when, when we hit next there again, hopefully it will then come up with, well, it will come up with uh, that the installation has succeeded. Well, I hope it will anyway, you know, sort of, uh, I have tested it quite considerably on a lot of systems and I'm hoping that sort of, uh, that, that all works for you. If it doesn't, email me, um, you know, sort of, uh, so stuff like that. And eventually it will say that this, this, this installation is successful. You know, sort of, uh, and thank you for, for choosing Marine Tools, so there we go. You know, sort of, uh, so, sort of, um, if you are a standard user and it's been installed for you with administrative privilege, and somebody else has ended up, you will need to run an extra uh, little little file. You know, sort of, uh, and here it is. It's either in Marine Tools and under RSOBIA, um, and it's in RSOBIA underscore install .bat, or wherever it is installed. So, sort of, uh, wherever you wherever you put it, you know, sort of, uh, should be all right. So. Just to just about finish, sort of there is the website again, uh, which probably you've probably gone to already, uh, sort of um, to, to register. I say it's got lots of functionality. When you download it, it will ask you for your name, email, organization, and a little privacy statement just to say, we just want to know who's downloaded it. That's all really, it's sort of uh, no more than that. And it, it is zipped up um, because it is not a good idea to send exe files across the internet. Apparently, I've been told my, my, my computer department. Um, and to un, unzip it, there is a password, which is CME21. Um, so that's that. So again, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to probably stop for you know, a couple of minutes and sort of noticing that we are slowly running out of time. I can do a live demo for people if they wish. I can try. Um, doing live demos is always fraught with difficulties. Um, we can have a go to show you what's going on, or we can then move on to uh, James's talk as well, talking about the, the types of things. So yeah, if we did a live demo, we might cover a few of these. We have a lot of time. I do have one other thing to say, is that, that on Monday, um, we will be talking about satellite-derived bathymetry and effectively, how do we map shallow water environments in the coastal zone? Can we estimate bathymetry using satellite data? Um, there's going to be two ways of doing this. There's going to be one using ArcGIS, again, um, or it's going to be using uh, Google Earth Engine, uh, which is an online resource. You do need to get an ID for it uh, to actually use this. If you wanted to do that, um, on the web page, if you actually go to the, 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 pro, the workshop web page. If you go right into it, you'll get to the sessions and date and it'll give you this link here. And effectively, you do want to have to be typing this out yourself. So sort of, um, but this will actually get you to sign in and be able to create yourself an ID so you can use Google Earth Engine, um, which we'll be, we'll be showing on Monday. So yes, we can do a, a live demo in a bit, um, but yes, do we want, a 10-minute uh, break. James, yep. how are we doing the time? 
Yeah, Tim, I think you're probably out of time, to be honest. I think you probably need to take a 10 minute break um, and head back at um, five past, something like that, five past the hour. I'm happy uh, to take then... questions, of course, but maybe Absolutely. if you want to type them in the chat and I will um, uh, be able to do that.